It's been a long time since I've given a homily uh, using some, actually before I give my homily, I do want to do some quick introductions. Uh, so we inducted, uh, I think, eight new altar boys last Sunday evening, and we have a new one here. Where's Herbert? So this guy here, he's a new altar server, so if you've never seen his face before, that's why, because you haven't seen his face before. Uh, we do have this other guy up here who you haven't seen before, so you can stand up as well. Stand up real quick. This guy here, this is Charlie Wessel. Charlie is a seminarian of the Archdiocese of Minneapolis. He's from St. Simon Parish on the east side. So he is at the Bishop Rute Seminary at Marion University up in uh, Indianapolis, and he is with us this evening. Uh, so he is not a new recruit altar server. God willing, he's a new recruit priest, uh, and will be celebrating uh, the holy sacrifice of the Master named bread and wine to the flesh and blood of Jesus, uh, which is awesome. So. It's been a long time since I've given a homily with signs and pictures, but uh, we're going to do one tonight, so here we go. Uh, altar boys, come on down. longed for. 
And his son's name is Isaac. And Abram is told by God to take his only son Isaac up a hill. And he makes his son carry up a hill wood upon his back. Because what has Abraham been asked to do to his son? To kill his son. So God has asked that Abraham's only begotten son be killed on a mountain after the boy, the son, carries wood for the sacrifice up a hill. Sound familiar? It's a prefigurement, it's a foretaste, it's a foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So both with Melchizedek and with Abraham and Isaac, we have foreshadowings of what? We have foreshadowings of our salvation, Charlie West. An only begotten son who carries wood up a cross, up a hill, dies upon a cross. Because what happens to Isaac? Does Isaac get killed? No. Because God doesn't demand human sacrifice. <clears throat> but God allows himself to die out of love for you and me so that we might have eternal life. But how do we gain access to this? So the night before he died, what does Jesus do? He institutes the Last Supper, which is what? Go to Melchizedek. A sacrifice of bread and wine offered by a priest who has no beginning and no end, which gains us access to the most perfect sacrifice of a spotless lamb of an only begotten son. So as we heard today in that second reading today from St. Paul, which is, which is, by the way, the oldest account that we have of the Eucharist. St. Paul's letters were written prior to the Gospels, which means that that accounting of the Last Supper is the oldest written account that we have of the Last Supper. And thus, the institution of the Eucharist gains us access to Calvary. So then what do we have to the Bush? We have every single mass, so hold that up, Mr. Roman Bush. The sacrifice of Melchizedek, the sacrifice of Isaac, the sacrifice of Calvary, and the Last Supper all find their culmination right here. Every single time that we celebrate the holy sacrifice of the mass, do we realize what we are gaining access to? I know that it may look like Father Meyer. I know that it may look like a bunch of high school students and it might look like Deacon Bob and it might look like a bunch of people singing and the person next to you is your neighbor and you don't like them or they cheated you once or they got in an argument with you in the parking lot once or... All of this seems really mystical, doesn't it? And sometimes we can look at the people around us or we can look at the priest or we can, and we can be like, that's not very mystical. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Abraham thought killing his son was pretty mystical? Do you think that the apostles who were jealous of each other, envious of each other, who were fishermen and tax collectors, thought that this was really some sort of mystical event? They didn't even understand what was going on at the time. This is where faith steps in. With faith, though, it all does make sense. We realize that what we are entering into is beyond our imagining. It literally is the fullness of Scripture, the fullness of truth, the fullness of revelation poured out for us upon this very altar. Scripture leads us always, always, always to the Eucharist. All of this leads us directly to the Eucharist. It leads to the moment right now where Jesus is going to say, this is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And just as he says, it demands a response. What will our response be to the fact that God died for us? That God gives us his flesh and blood? That God gives us the only begotten son? That God gives us a priest who lives forever? What is our response? Let's pray tonight that our response is more than a 10% of our income. Let's pray tonight that our response is that we just say, yes, Lord, I'm yours. Yes, Lord, I give you everything. Lord, my life is yours. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I'm yours.
Let's pray tonight that we become overwhelmed with the fullness of truth and salvation, the fullness of biblical history that is found in the Mass, in every single Mass, and that our response is yes. Yes to God, yes to His will, yes to His way, and yes to a life of freedom and peace and joy in the Lord. May the Eucharist lead us and guide us to truth and to freedom. Amen.